fellowship in dental sciences from the Royal College of England, UK, and her MBA from Chennai. She has over 15 years of academic experience, having worked as a faculty in national and international institutes, and has attended and presented lectures at numerous conferences. She has received the Magna Cum Laude and Sadbhavana Awards. She is currently affiliated to Ragas Dental College as a professor. Her areas of interest include implants, orthognathic surgery, maxillofacial trauma, cleft lip, and palate. We welcome you, ma'am. Over to Dr. Melita to introduce the mentors. Thank you, Rinaldi. Good evening, everyone. We have two eminent speakers, Dr. Baig and Dr. George Paul today to enlighten us on temporomandibular joint disorders, cysts and benign tumors. Dr. Mirza F. Baig, Professor Emeritus in Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Savita Dental College. He completed his master's in oral and maxillofacial surgery in 1975 at Madras University. He has been teaching postgraduates for over 43 years. He has many international and national publications to his credit, and he has delivered orations at various national and state forums. Dr. Baig has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from National AMSI and Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry State AMSI and Savita University. It's an honor to have you, sir. Dr. George Paul has completed his MDS DNB, LLB, and Diploma in Medical Law. He was formerly Professor of OMFS and uh, formerly Medical Director at Sharon Cancer Center, past National President of AMSI, past Honorary General Secretary of AMSI, and currently Honorary Adjunct Professor at, uh, sorry, formerly Adjunct Professor at uh, Medical MJR Medical University. He is currently member faculty of dentistry at Kerala University of Health Sciences, adjunct professor at D.Y. Patil University, Pune, and consultant oral and maxillofacial surgery surgeon in Salem, Tamil Nadu. It is an honor to have both of you all, sir. Now over to Dr. Satyabama to moderate the session. Hi, good evening, one and all. It's a great pleasure. At the outset, I would thank the AOMSI team for allowing us to be a part of this huge program that has been conducted um, for helping the postgraduate students to go ahead with their curriculum in spite of the pandemic that we are facing. Um, today, the topic that we are um, going to be dealing with is about, one is about TMJ by Professor Dr. Baig. You've been introduced by him with, uh, about him. And the next topic is about cysts and benign tumors by uh, Dr. George Paul. Now, on to you, uh, Baik, sir, for the presentation on the TMJ. Can we, can we have the uh, slideshow, please? Thank you. At the outset, the uh, temporomandibular joint is uh, called the ginglimodiatroidal joint, as you guys all of, all of us know about it. Um, it actually has a condylar head, which is being uh, which is articulating with the glenoid fossa. You have the articular disc in between them, which separates the joint compartment into the superior and the inferior joint compartment. The disc per se is been divided into the anterior portion, intermediate portion, and the posterior band. The dart, which will move along with the condyle. The condyle, when it is moving, it is called gingly move because it has a hinge movement and then it translates as well. So to start with, it is the lower compartment that goes on with the rotational movement and then translates, which is taken up by the superior compartment. And henceforth, the two joints together work together and produce the movement that is, which is opening and closing of the mouth. Now, normally when we are looking at the uh, uh, anatomical positioning of the disc and the joint, the disc within the joint is at a 12 o'clock position. The posterior band is at a 12 o'clock position to the condyle, which would be the normal positioning of the disc. 
But as the uh, aging process happened and as there is an internal problem that's happening within the uh, uh, articular compartment, then there are problems which result in a derangement internally within the joint. And we have the internal derangement starting with the myofascial pain going on up to the osteoarthritis. Now, the question that has been asked to us is, the first question to us is Dr. Baker, is about what is disc plication? Yeah, uh, thank you all for inviting me for this session. Yeah, the first question is about the disc plication. Plication is nothing but taking a wedge out of the lax disc and then suturing it, or in other words, folding and tucking with sutures that the weakened and stretched disc is tightened. That's all about the disc plication. The next question is about what is discopexy? Uh, discopexy. So when the uh, meniscus or the disc, when there is uh, <clears throat> anterior displacement or anterior medial displacement, which is quite common, we try to retrieve it and anchor it to the head of the condyle and fix it. That is, a disc is surgically fixed to the head of the condyle that is called as discopexy. Earlier on, we were using, uh, <clears throat> after opening the joint, <clears throat> we tried to retrieve the disc, drill a hole in the lateral pole of the condyle and try to <clears throat> take a bite from the disc which is displaced and anchor it. Nowadays, there are better techniques. Instead of drilling a hole, we are placing a screw called as mitec, tech, mitec screw and the anteriorly or anterior medially displaced disc is repositioned and fixed to the head of the condyle. So when the condyle moves, it takes the displaced uh, disc which has been repositioned to move along with it. That is called as discopexy. So there is a question which was asked uh, about discoplasty. I know this terminology does not exist with us, but then oh. they also went on to ask the difference between a discopexy and a discoplasty. So, sir, what's your take on that? I, I think there are two different things. There is no discoplasty, as you said. Probably it means application where it's being repaired and molded and restored. Whereas a discopexy, you are trying to retrieve the uh, displaced disc and anchoring it to the head of the company. That's the basic difference. So there is, it, it is not the same. Discoplexy and discopexy is not the same. No. Thank you, sir. Now, the other questions are moving on to the internal derangements. As we all know, anything happening within the structural components of the joint will result in a deranged joint. And that we call that as internal derangement. And we know that will be a stage them depending on the conditions that they are presenting with. We have stage one to four. Now, the first question is, is the mechanism behind the reciprocal click and the second click that is heard during the anterior disc displacement with reduction the same? What now, happens? Yes, yes. Sorry, sir. No, no, continue what you want to say. No. The thing is here, there are two things. One is the anterior disc displacement with reduction, which means it goes back into its own original position. And the other, the next staging is anterior disc displacement without reduction. Yes, sir, please. Yeah, uh, in the first case where <laughs> in the closed mouth position, the, and the disc is anteriorly displaced. When you try to open, it tries to regain the normal position. So the displaced disc rides over the head of the contact. That is initially when you have mouth opening is between 10 to 15 millimeters and you, had a, you hear a click. And before you hear a click, there'll be a deviation <clears throat> to the same side and you hear a click. That's the time when the, the disc is repositioned to the normal, that is the head of the condyle. 
and it comes back to the normal. After this, if you try to open and close, after this is subdued, you don't hear a click. The best thing to find out about is to keep a spacer, a couple of tongue blades, after it's, you hear the clicking noise, and then try to ask the patient to try to open and close the mouth, you will not hear the clicking. So this is one small clinical test to find out <clears throat> whether the click is because of the anterior, arterially displaced disc which gets reduced from the other causes of clicking like hypermobility or presence of uh, intra-articular bodies like arthrolis or even soft tissue thickening of the anterior slope for the uh, articular eminence. The other one of course is the uh, anteriorly displaced reduction. In the closed mouth it is lying anterior to that. Even while opening it, it does not come back to the normal position. It stays there throughout the normal excursion. And, and it does not cause any click at all. The limit, there is a limitation of mouth opening and it is very, very painful. That's the basic difference between a disc which gets reduced. The other one is a disc with, without reduction. Uh, that's the um, anterior displaced disc sir, which is uh, yeah 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 true. Yet another thing that you see wherever you have this uh, dis displacement with reduction or even without reduction, <clears throat> there will be a lateral movement to the same side without any restriction. But if you try to move it to the contralateral side, there is a lot of restriction. That is another characteristic feature of a disc displacement with reduction or without reduction. There was a so, question asking us about the amount of the bilaminar posterior disc stretching that happens, sir, so that the patient actually, though there is a lot of restriction in their movements, because of the compensatory posterior bilaminar disc, they kind of seem to have normal mouth opening. What's your take on that, sir? Yeah, it appears so. Uh, but, you know, eventually, you know, this is a progressive thing. Eventually, there will be a lot of inflammation in the retrodiscal tissue. Uh, and they will have what is called as the retrodiscitis. Because it is richly innervated. And that is one of the main causes of pain. And uh, as, as it progresses, uh, they, there may be... A, uh, 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 a change or a pathology or like perforation of the meniscus and there'll be a bone to bone contact. Instead of listening, I mean, instead of hearing a click, you'll hear a crepitus where there's a grating motion between the two uh, bony surfaces. So this happens whenever there is a small perforation or a large perforation. Yes, sir. Moving on to next, the next uh, uh, condition of ankylosis. Now, yeah. the question posted to us is, when to do ankylosis uh, release in a child who's less than 14 years of age? Now, all of us know that ankylosis means stiff joint, and we also know that this can happen starting from birth to at any given, any age or any stage the patient can be in. And depending on when the problem within the joint or the hemarthrosis happens, then the clinical findings are pertaining as for the condition that the patient develops at the staging of the uh, onset of the, the process, the disease process. Now, yes, sir. And the, the grading goes by uh, Shawnee's stage one to four. And yeah. he talks about uh, absolutely normal uh, condyla head with fibrous adhesions and type two, where there's just a misshaped head of the condyla head with no involvement of the sigmoid notch and the coronoid process. And type three, where there's a big bony block, which is what we saw in this city out here. All right. Then, uh, and uh, type four, the normal anatomy is completely entirely displaced. So there's a big bony block between the ramus and the skull base. Yeah, your, your answer to the question, when would you do a release on a child who's less than 14 years, sir? As early as possible, as, as long as the child is cooperative, 
even probably five to six years, seven years, you can go ahead and do it. You don't have to wait for, uh, I mean, till the child grows to say 15, 14 years. Yeah. Earlier, the better. Because okay. once you establish function, the growth also will be normal. Okay, but whereas in an adult, then in that case, suppose a case like this with unilateral or a bilateral ankylosis, yes. then what would be your uh, algorithm to go about with it, sir? Yeah, if, if it is uh, unilateral, earlier on we are uh, using the postochondral graph. Now that we have the total TMG prosthesis, one is the stock uh, TMG prosthesis, that is the Lawrence. At the end of our talk, we are going to show that. The other one is now that we have the technology of what we call as 3D printing. So everything is custom made for that particular patient. And earlier on, we were relying only on costochondral graph, and it 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 uh, it's only interface. Earlier, to to quote Irby, he said one one centimeter of the cartilage should be there. Now we are saying that it should be only five millimeters because he just want to have an interface. It is not a growth center; it's a growth site. Although there are reports that there is a war growth because of this cartilage. Sir, yeah. So this is a patient who had, uh, okay. that's her mouth opening. I mean, this mm. is her mouth opening that we see here. And that's her into occlusion. And so, you know, that has been completely given an oral hygiene exercise. So it looks pretty neat and clean normally because of their red mouth breathing and because of their reduced uh, mouth opening. And by the way, bilateral ankylosis, they present with, you know, proclined teeth, moral occlusion, poor oral hygiene, poor nutrition, and hence anemic, you know, all of those factors. So clinically, when we are looking at them, that's the STL uh, model that you talked about, sir. So that's the ankylosis, that's, which is complete on the right side. And the mm -hmm. coronoid process actually, you know, it becomes elongated, trying to compensate for the joint that is not functioning. Absolutely. So, yeah, so that's how, that's how the uh, patient presents herself with. Now, yeah. sir, a small note on the incisions that you would normally like to make for these kind of uh, ankylotic procedures, sir. Yeah, uh, no, in our experience, uh, we always uh, try to use the alkali brand the incision, which gives a wide exposure so that you have a gain, you gain an access to the entire joint area. So you can uh, resect the ankylotic mass and try to reconstruct it, whichever material you want to do it. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the next yeah. question was if bilateral TMJ ankylosis is present in a young female who's 22 year old, then which is the best approach that you would do for the surgical, um, one of the surgeries that you would plan for? Yeah, one, one option is uh, yeah, you can go uh, do a bi uh, bicoronal flap and gain access to both the TMJ. Otherwise, you have a conventional method of opening one side and going on to the other side. Okay, sir. All right. Now, a note on dislocation, sir. Um, my bilateral mandibular dislocation of the mandible. All of us yes. know that, yeah, the joint, the condyle within the glenoid fossa sits yes. right up there and it rotates and translates for all the movements that is happening. Now, when the condylar head comes anterior to the articular eminence, in other words, when it dislocates, okay, so we need to understand here very clearly, deviation is different, dislocation is different. The, this, the location, the joint, the condyle per se, is dislocated into a different place from its glenoid fossa. that is dislocation. So in a dislocation that is happening bilaterally in an individual, now you are noticing that the patient is not able to close the mouth with severe pain, okay, and, and presence in the A&E. So how do we go, go about reducing this joint? Yeah, conventional methods of uh, reducing it, uh, use your nilatance method, or the other, other one is called, yes, the, uh, uh, pressing in the premolar teeth downwards at the same time, press in the underneath of the chin, and upwards and backwards. You have to first depress it first and then only take it backwards and upwards. This is the uh, age old technique called as nilatance technique. 
The other one, of course, uh, some people have used is what is called as the wrist pivot method, and some of them also have used the extraoral method. But conventionally, this works Nilayton's technique, uh, which has been used for many, many years. Yes, sir. Um, but then, you know, sometimes if this uh, condition has been persisting on this patient for a long yeah. period of time, say, That's for example, it, <laughs> it happens sometime in the afternoon or even early in the day, and, he's, and you're seeing him in the a &E by about evening, um, you know, what are the problems that the um, person will be facing, the, um, the yeah, max it, Yeah. It's not only that the, the head of the condyle has come out and it's lying in front of that. There will be a severe muscular spasm. So that is another reason why, in, uh, you know, under local, you may not be able to reduce it. So if the patient is fit, it's better to take the patient under GA and try to reduce it. If, if there is a lot of delay and the patient represents to you, then you may have to even resort to condylotomy or condyl condylectomy to get back the the mandible in position. Is there a difference between um, a subluxation and a dislocation, sir? Subluxation is uh, recurrent, self-reducing. Dislocation is uh, very acute mostly, and patient cannot reduce it to normal patient. Whereas a subluxation, a chronic subluxation, the patient, they themselves, <clears throat> they try to bring it back to the normal patient. That's a basic difference. Okay. And what about a patient with, for example, with a motor neuron disease, and then he's chronically, he or she is chronically dislocating. What would be your advice on such patients? Chronically, yes. <clears throat> Maybe you'll have to do some, <clears throat> resort to some surgical procedures of either <clears throat> creation, creating a mechanical block or a removal of a mechanical obstacle like geminectomy or condylectomy or even uh, resorting to some muscle balance, like, uh, you know, temporal scarification, things like that. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, these are all the options. Yes, sir. Now, the other question is about the arthrocentesis. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, what are the landmarks of arthrocentesis? Now, if you are using, a, 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 as an outpatient procedure, when you are using the two needles, the first needle, uh, you, know, you first you have to draw a line from the outer canthus of the eye to the tragus. And from the tragal point, anteriorly 10 millimeters and two millimeters below will be the point A. Then one more point you take again from the A point, another 10 millimeters and come down another <clears throat> four millimeters. These are the two points. So you have to insert two needles and then inject slowly. So you are going in, into the uh, superior joint space and you are trying to inject the uh, ringer lactic solution. When you are doing this technique, you cannot I mean, inject more than probably 30, 40 ml. But when you are doing it arthroscopically, you can go up to 300 ml. That's an advantage. Advantage. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. So I think uh, we are moving on. Um, mm. The difference between... Uh, condyle are hypoplasia and mm. hyperplasia. Yeah, Thank hypoplasia, yeah, <clears throat> yeah it, it, it could be related to any congenital <clears throat> uh, conditions. Uh, you, you can talk of, say, hemifacial microsomia or Horner's syndrome or, or a child who has sustained injury in uh, childhood or even rheumatoid arthritis, still disease. So it is all present almost right from the birth. Whereas hyperplasia occurs much later when there is, that can be easily identified by elongated neck of the condyle. There is lateral, uh, lateral atheism or lateral open bite. There'll be bowing of the, there'll be shift off to the opposite side. There'll be bowing of the lower border along with that, <coughs> the inferior alveolar canal. And because of the dental compensation, there'll be a canting of this. So this is how a, a condylar hyperplasia can be identified. And a, a, that is different from the condylar hypoplasia. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions that have come up, but I think we'll finish up with the reconstruction and then go back to the questions. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. 
So yeah. the next next thing is about uh, your condyla reconstruction. Uh, how would you go about with it? Uh, yeah. So as, as I said, uh, whenever you are doing a, uh, ankylotic release, so earlier we were using the rib grafts from the fifth or the sixth graft. And nowadays, with the advanced technology, we have the custom made with the 3D printing technology. <clears throat> it is very specific and it fits well. So you can have a FOSA component, which is made up of a polyethylene, high molecular weight polyethylene, which is fitted onto the lateral aspect of the zygomatic arch. And the ramal component is a, uh, a titanium with aluminum and vanadium. So the, the stock joint that uh, we are going to see a little later is called the Lawrence uh, Total TMJ uh, prosthesis. It is a, they have three different sizes in that, small, medium, and large. So once you open this, once you remove the condyle, and when you remove the articular remnants, shave it off, you can try it. They have templates for these three. So whichever is <clears throat> closer to that, then you unpack the, the sterile uh, TMJ concept thing and then fit it. So they have two components, one for the fossa and one for the... The same thing is done now with the help of uh, CT and uh, stereolithic graphic model and 3D printing. The fit is better and the function is also better. So this is what you are actually seeing is that it's very specific custom-made joint with a FOSA component, which is a <clears throat> high molecular weight polyethylene, which is fixed onto the lateral surface of the zygomatic arch. And the, uh, in the ramus, you see the, the ramal component, which is uh, titanium, aluminum, vanadium alloy. So when you're looking at these kind of um, uh, TMG ankylosis patient, you clinically examine them, sir. So you're looking, thinking at uh, right, this is not unilateral, this is bilateral, or it's bony ankylosis on one side and a fibrous on the other side. Then, yeah. you know, for Caban's protocol that we have for the unilateral TMG ankylosis, now if it is a bilateral ankylosis, now mm -hmm. we also already said that, you know, depending on the onset, time of onset and the stage of onset and the severity of the progress, uh, yeah. the treatment plan will differ. So for example, you if you're looking at a bilateral TMG ankylosis, the question here is, what is your, um, how will you go about with your treatment protocols? Now, if it is a child below, say, eight years, we would prefer to give a bilateral, I mean, release the bilateral ankylosis and <clears throat> give a cost account graph. So it not only provides the site, but also maintains the height of the uh, uh, ramus. So they, they do not end up with uh, anterior open bite. On the other hand, if it is a, uh, an adult, you can you can very well go ahead with all, with the custom made uh, uh, rosa component as well as the ramal component mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the three D printing, uh, all this technology, advanced technology, it will have a better fit and it gives a better function as well. Okay. Okay, there are some questions which I think uh, are um, already been answered. Uh, answered okay. there, sir. So, okay. um, now this one question that I also used to ponder when I was uh, a very young, and I was a youngster: How do you clinically differentiate between a unilateral condylar hyperplasia versus a hypoplasia clinically? Yeah, clinically, I. I told you, if it is a hyperplasia, clinically, there'll be a deviation to the contralateral side. And Thank there'll you. be, yeah, and there'll be lateral open bite. There'll be bowing of the lower border. Along with that, you see the uh, inferior uh, vessel, inferior alveolar nerve, or the inferior alveolar canal itself. And there'll be a dental compensation. And you can see the, uh, what you call, canting. This is how you identify clinically a, uh, most important thing is the, the neck of the condyles is elongated. 
uh, question has just come in. Would you do a distraction first or would you go about doing the ankylosis release first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very controversial. <laughs> yeah, I, I think ideally it would be better to do the distraction first and then release the, the ankylosis. Right? Personally, I would do that. I think there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of controversy there, sir. Um, yeah. yeah, depending on you know how much of facial asymmetry you cause the patient has, what age you're looking at the patient with, what is the concern for the patient, uh, and then yeah, how do no, you? No, no. If you are thinking of only releasing the uh, ankylotic mass and following uh, followed by the distraction, you have a lot of problems. Whereas if you opt to do any orthognathic surgery to correct the facial deformity, well and good. But if you're going to release the joint and then follow it up with a distraction, you'll end up with problems. Okay. All right? Agreed, sir. Because you have no control over the proximal segment. It can go back. And because of that, you know, they may even have other problems like bradycardia, dyspnea, things like that. There are a lot of uh, articles written by uh, several of the senior or maxillofacial surgeons regarding this. So personally, if you ask, I would do uh, first a distraction if I have uh, opt for this and then go for the TMJ ankylosis release. But if you are wanting to do a correction of uh, the deformity by orthognathic surgery, then, yes, first release it, then go ahead with the orthognathic surgery. Yes, sir. Right? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. yes, sir. The next question is about uh, difference between fibromyalgia and myofacial pain dysfunction syndrome. Yeah. See, I fi fibromyalgia is a very general term, the fatigue order with uh, no, no, it is no involvement of the joint or the muscle inflammation. Whereas uh, uh, myofacial pain dysfunction syndrome is mainly related to the muscle pain, which is caused by many a time a consistent clenching uh, uh, because of flexing, flexism, or uh, even daytime parafunctional habits. They, many of these patients, they have some psychosocial problems, and uh, it all happens during the rapid eye movement. So because of the constant flinching, the muscles are put to fatigue and this fatigue eventually leads to pain. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Right. What's, your, what's the next question is, what's your take on TENS in uh, temp TMJ? Yeah, TENS, uh, uh, it is an adjuvant uh, therapy actually, and it helps. <clears throat> Uh, in reducing the pain. And <clears throat> of course, there are two methods by which this can be explained. One is a peripheral action. <clears throat> you have this uh, electrodes placed in the muscles. And because of this, uh, there will be some mild contraction of the muscles and it relaxes the muscles and it removes and increases the blood flow and decreases the hypoxia and also decreases the pain. That is the peripheral action. The central action is, if you, if you go back to your uh, gate control theory, yes, the sir. pain, the necessity, uh, no, no, the impulses are carried by the small fibers to that. So this tries to either cancel it or block it. So you have peripheral action as well as a central action. And it is an adjuvant therapy to release relief of pain. It is very useful, no doubt about it. <clears throat> Okay, I think we answered this uh, recurrent dislocation. Yes. Um, yes. Now, the potential risk in ankylosis release. All right. <laughs> now, no, you can't call it a risk. Uh, what are the problems like, you know, complications that would arise? Uh, no, no. Initially, you find it difficult to intubate because of the restricted mouth opening. Yes. Earlier sir. on, <clears throat> some of the senior uh, anesthesiologists, we were able to do the so-called blind awake intubation, which is quite traumatic to the patient because the patient is awake. So only few anesthetists can perform that. Then you then came the <coughs> retrograde technique of passing a wire from the trichotheroid membrane going into that and then threading the uh, endotracheal tube to that to reach the vocal cord. 
that again is quite dramatic. The, the gold standard would be to use the fiber uh, optic assisted uh, endotracheal tube intubation. The, uh, the last result, if you cannot do any uh, uh, by any of this method, is to do a tracheostomy, but it has its own morbidity. Then the other intraoperative procedures are uh, one, of course, is your nerve, uh, facial nerve injury. You have to be careful because <clears throat> the temporal fascia, when it comes down above the uh, zygomatic arch, it splits into two outer and inner layer. The outer layer comes and fuses with the periosteum of the zygomatic arch. All the branches of the facial nerve lie above the periosteum. If you keep your uh, uh, dissection subperiosteally, you are safe. And then you should know how much of how much distance is there from the external artery meters to the sparkation of the, the main trunk, and also from the post linear tubercle to the midpoint of the zygomatic arch. If you know the a, a normal uh, average then you are safe. So keep the, keep the incision and keep the dissection as close as possible to the tragus and go subperiosally and don't come below the lobule of the ear so that you will not injure any of the branches of this. This the third one, of course, your uh, maxillary artery bleed. If you are a little careless when you are trying to release it after using the burr init uh, initially, you start <coughs> re removing a large a uh, chunk of bone, and then as you go deeper and deeper, uh, and the callus is huge, then you try to bring it down. And then you try to use an osteotome. If your osteotome is, you are not careful in using it, it might slip and go and hit the internal maxillary artery, which lies medial to that. So you'll have a very profuse bleeding. It's very difficult to control that. Yes, sir. that is yeah. why they always ask us to use a condylar retractor support exactly. between of the sphenomandibular ligament and the condylar head lies your maxillary artery. Exactly. So yes. yeah, yes. you insert that and then you support and then you go for your your uh, osteo osteotomy. Uh, you know, final. Yeah. yeah. Then yes, about sir. the post-operative period reankylosis. Why does reankylosis matter? If you remember, <clears throat> the causes for non-union of the fracture. When the gap between the two fragments is larger than one centimeter, uh, then, then uh, if there is an interposition of any foreign body or muscle, and if the patient is moving all the time, the same thing you apply here. You create a large gap, you deliberately interpose some material, and you follow it up with physiotherapy. So you will not end up with re -ankylosis. You do not do this, then probably the patient will come back. You don't remove adequate bone and you don't interpose, and you don't give proper instruction, and the patient is happy once you remove it, I mean, release the ankylosing. He doesn't come for a follow-up, even if you send letters or messages. Only when he gets a re then he comes to you. Mm -hmm. All and this also, op oh, yeah, open by facial asymmetry yes, <laughs> that can be addressed either by a distraction or yeah, orthognathic procedures. Yeah, aggressive physiotherapy is another one, sir. I think that absolutely. needs to be, that yeah, needs absolutely. To be completely yeah. followed uh, meticulously. Yeah. You know, if that is not done, then, you know, re exactly. is yeah. big So one way problem. of motivation is ask the patient to use the tongue blades. Initially, you ask the patient, see, you may be able to put, say, 10 blades. Second day or third day, he's able to put 12 blades. So he knows, okay, I'm able to open more. So that is a motivation for the patient. So giving a Ferguson gag to open and close, but give them simple tongue blades, wooden blades, and ask them to increase it slowly one by one. Um, the other oh, yeah. question that's been asked is, sir, you know, when we're doing these arthrosynthesis, mm -hmm. most of the time, you know, the uh, I think that comes by practice and by the tactile sensation. When you're inserting your needle, it hits. The question is, needle does not hit the right spot in the first go. So mm. how do you how do you ascertain where you are and how do you go about to hit the right spot is the question, sir. But, <laughs> what you're talking is about uh, needle or arthroscope? <laughs> needle, plain needle. needle, plain no, needle. First, you have to identify, you have to mark the head of the condyle, ask the patient to move or open the mouth. You know mm. it is moving. Right? So mm -hmm. when, when the patient opens the mouth, the yeah. condyle moves forward. 
So then you, you can gain access to the superior joint space. That's, a, that's the easiest method of it. So you have to market pragmatic cards as well as the head of the company. Right, sir. I think okay. we'll go on. Um, <laughs> roller therapy, sir, is there anything that you can talk about? Uh, yeah, for, yeah, roller therapy, but uh, yes, injection of uh, dextrose. By my uh, experience, is very limited, so I cannot comment much on that. Yeah, it's regenerative to grow stimulus. Yeah. You know, the orthopedic yeah, yeah. things inject, uh, you know, true, true, uh, very true. steroids yeah. into the knee joint. So similar yeah. to that, um, exactly. I mean, to be honest with you, I have not done that, but I've read, read a few articles about it. And exactly, have, same they thing. They swear with me also. by saying it must work. And yeah, we have it, a colleague who does that as well. So, oh, okay. um, <laughs> yes. <Fine>. So, <laughs> okay. Good luck yeah. to him. <laughs> yeah, right, oh, sir. Um, okay. The okay. next is your videos that are starting up, sir. Oh, good, good. That's nice. Okay. Yeah, the first one is, uh, is uh, use of arthroscope to release the band, fibrous band. So you must be trained to do it. You have three different levels of this, level one, level two, and level three. So in the level one, you just see the joint, diagnostic purposes, you can do a lavage. And in level two, you can do this uh, fib fibrous band release by cutting it. You can see the, the scissors cutting it there. And level three, of course, the, you have the uh, discopexy procedures. So people who are trained in this, they can very well do this. And this is a case of a retrodiscitis. Patient is having severe pain. And when she opens, she complains of pain and there is a deviation to the affected side. So with arthroscope, they have done, of course, I must give credit to uh, Dr. Arun from Coimbatore who, who has been kind enough to give me this uh, video. So you can see the patient is having a lot of pain. She's not able to move to the affected side, but she's able to move to the contralateral side, very characteristic. And there is inflammation of the retrodiscal tissue, which is uh, you know, highly innervated. So you, you a simple lavage method because many of these pain producing substances are removed by uh, using this. You can, if you are using a arthroscope, you can go up to 300 ml of uh, ringer lactate. So it, 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 it removes all the pain producing substances like prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and cytokines, all those things. And the inflammation is reduced. It improves the synovial fluid lubrication. The patient is back and she is able to open the mouth without much pain. And there is no deviation as such. Thanks to Dr. Arun from Poimitu, who has uh, done this procedure himself. So now you can see the patient is not having pain. She is able to open the mouth normally. Right. Discopexy is yes. What we were doing initially was after we exposed the joint, try to retrieve the displaced disc, do a high condylectomy or condylar shave, drill a hole in the outer pole of the condyle, pass a non absorbable suture from the disc and then and then pass it through the hole that you have made and so that when the patient moves or opens the disc moves along with the head of the contour. Nowadays we have the better methods of doing it using a mitric uh, screw or even a, a micro screw of the orthodontist which is used. So instead of drilling a hole they can put the screw and then past the non-absorbable suture. It serves the purpose. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, so I think you, Hindus, you have used the orthodontic screw more than the, rather than the mitex screw. Uh, yeah. The mini orthodontic screw that you used, yep. Yeah. Are you talking no, in, in, the, in the video what I showed, no. We, we did not use any of the screws. We just drilled a hole. And through the hole, we pass the suture. That's it. We never use any screw there. Earliest, early uh, uh, our disco fixing, which is done by us, 
nowadays they are using the orthodontic screw as well as the mitex screw thanks to dr thomas and his team for lending the pictures but we are not able to show it now but they are doing lot of this running short of time i think you still have time <laughs> well sir um yeah yeah what uh, what next yeah, the quick questions that have come up are about would you always remove the medial ankylotic chunk in all cases of all ages in tmj ankylosis if yes why no, no unless you create a gap of say 1.5 cm there is no point in leaving something behind so when you start cutting from the lateral aspect <clears throat> as you go down when the in the callus is huge you are scared so it it becomes you know as and go down and down and medially it becomes stapled so this is one of the causes unless you remove a good block of bone of 1.5 cm the chances of recurrence are very very high so you have to remove enough of bone even from the medial side you have to yeah this is probably the last uh, uh, so this, uh, thanks to my friend dr george demetrelis from melbourne he is more into this so he has he has uh, removed the the condyle because of osteoarthritis and then he flattened the articular eminence the articular eminence is flat now then he uses uh, the fossa component which i said about this is the excise condyle <clears throat> the the fossa component is made up of the high molecular weight polyethylene which is like a butterfly and it can be fixed on the lateral aspect of the zygomatic arch with titanium screws the ramal component is fixed by making an incision in the angle of the mandible and tunneling it releasing all that before you do all that you have to get the teeth in occlusion with uh, transmucosal screws and putting it tie wires and this comes in three different sizes small medium and large so depending on, upon your requirement you can use a template to see whether small is okay or the big one is okay so now you have tunneled it and you are placing the ramal component in the ramus with 2 mm screws the length will vary from 10 mm to 8 mm so you can see the whole thing in the joint the fossa component is there attached to the zygomatic arch and the, the, the ramal component from below that's uh, wonderful sir uh, we just looking at <laughs> and All right. if there's any other questions that have been asked okay. um i think we finished uh, right on time <laughs> thank you so much sir for yeah, your sharing welcome. your expertise with us Thanks and i would like Thanks. to thank uh, for all the pictures and the videos and i'd right, also like to thank my um, virbahu sir who's uh, allowed me to share some of the cases that we did in the unit as Fantastic. well fantastic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, uh, thanks. Sir. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jimson and his team uh, for giving me this opportunity. I hope the students have got the benefit of learning something different in some of the conventional writing. Okay, that's good. So, I'm repeating the video. <laughs> true, sir. For the sake okay. of the postgrads. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. True. Very true. this is called as a lorentz uh, tmj prosthesis it's a stock joint nowadays of course you have this uh, uh, custom made one which has got a better fit all right thank you sir welcome most welcome thank you very much bye 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 thank you dr zimson and your team for giving me this opportunity thank you one and all thank you sir thank you thank you welcome
Now you can stop the. Yeah, I didn't stop sharing. Yeah, sorry. I've done it. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Touch call, sir. Good evening, uh, Jim. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Sadi Baba. <clears throat> And so, sir, today's topic, uh, as you know, is about cysts and benign tumors. Um, and we are starting dot on. Right. It's a pleasure to, uh, I have to ask a very cliched question. Can you hear me? For two reasons, you know, my voice isn't all that great. And uh, also because I'm in a different place from where I'm usually so. Absolutely sound and clear, sir. So uh, it's a great pleasure to share this uh, platform with Dr. Big, uh, who was not directly taught me, but I consider him a very inspiring teacher. And uh, thank you, Jimson and uh, Satibama for having me. If we can start. Uh, Yeah. Now the topic is about cysts and benign tumors. Now all of us know about these cysts. Now in our topic, we are not really covering the entire gamut of the, you know, the cysts and the benign odontogenic, non-odontogenic tumors. We put it ourselves the questions that have been asked and we kind of went around the system. So today, um, um, when we're looking at a cyst, first let's deal with the cyst. Now, we all know that this is a pathological cavity that may be filled with fluid, semi-fluid, gaseous content and may or may not be lined by epithelium. The first question in itself goes to the differential diagnosis of a unilocular radiolucent lesion um, in uh, the posterior mandible. Hello? Uh, Satibama, I can't actually see the slide. Do I need to do something? Just give us a couple of minutes. Sir. Yeah, actually, we are not able to uh, see the presentation. I I'm assuming Satibama is doing it because I, I haven't seen the presentation either. <laughs> I think you'll stop uh, sharing and then restart. Which is what I'm trying to do. It's, it's going back. Now you can restart sharing. Can we have the? Um... No, we can't see the slide again. At least I can't. The slide on. I can't see it. Yeah, so yeah. Give, just uh, so give us a couple of seconds. All right. Oh, no problem. No problem. Take your time. Can we? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. So that's what assist is. So we'll move on. Yes, sir. So that's the uh, di differential diagnosis of the unilocular radiolucent lesions in the posterior mandible. It can be uh, starting as simple as uh, a residual cyst, and then it can go on. Yeah. Yes, sir, on to you, please. So, uh, is there a question? Sorry, uh, you said something about a cyst. I, I think I'll just put in a word about what a cyst is. You know, you have a definition, and I think that definition is an extremely you know, compact definition where every word has, uh, it, it has an import. Um, uh, we say a cyst is a pathological cavity. Now. Uh, you may think that it is a very superfluous statement to make, but you must remember that uh, uh, your mouth is also a cavity. Uh, it is lined by epithelium. 
uh, but you don't call it a cyst, right? So it has to be pathological. The word pathological is very important in the, in the beginning itself. And uh, uh, it may or may not contain uh, uh, contents like uh, a fluid or solid or even it, may, it might even be empty. Uh, but most of the time you do have an epithelial lining. Uh, and uh, I think it, this, this is an extremely compact uh, definition that you can use in your answers to a viva or a, a theory paper question. And as I said, every word is important in that. And as we go on, we will discuss cis and the various contents. Yeah. The uh, diagnosis sir, of a unilocular radiolucent lesion in the posterior mandible. Yeah, that is like asking me to deliver a complete uh, presentation on cysts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Think, uh, uh, a unilocular uh, well, cyst could be, I mean, a unilocular pathology could be a cyst, it could be a tumor, it could be a giant cell granuloma, it could be uh, numerous things, you know. Uh, ontogenic tumors uh, could be a, a whole range of uh, pathologies that occur in the uh, Mandible. So I think the radiographic presentation of it being unilocular and the kind of margins it has, where it occurs, and uh, and very importantly, I think uh, this is something that I have started doing uh, more frequently because of the occasional cases of uh, uh, intra-bony vascular lesions. It's a good idea to always aspirate and know what its contents are. Uh, so. As I said, it could be anything. It, it, it's a very wide thing. And I think as we go, we will be discussing some of the- Okay, the question, that's, the question that's coming up is, if you're going to be aspirating, if you're doing a fine needle aspiration cytology, then where would you do it, sir? Which part of the area? Where, if you're looking at a huge cyst like this, like an OKC now, where would you do it? Obviously, you would try to do it inside the mouth if, it's, if the bulge is inside the mouth and at the thinnest place because the needle has to go through, so. Okay. Okay. Right. Right, Osa. So, okay. So that's your diagnosis. A small uh, comparison between the OKC and the amyloblastoma here. Now, most of it, as you were rightly saying, you know, they are all, they're all almost similar, starting from the clinical prevalence, second and third decade, localization, the site, the clinical considerations of being asymptomatic, unless until and unless they become secondarily infected. And the surgical treatment that's going to go happen is a decompression. You go with either a PASH1 or PASH2 techniques, and then uh, you go, go ahead with um, a resection if you're looking at a huge amyloblastoma, which is much luckier when you're thinking an aggressive lesion. The radiographic presentation also sometimes is almost similar. It's just the histopathological differentiation that actually differentiates between uh, these two uh, things, the, odonto, the odontogenic keratocyst and the amyloblastoma, which are almost cynical and almost similar in many, many, many aspects of it. So um, that is the differentiation factor between the two. Now, um, yes, sir, when you do a FNAC in an OKC, you would be getting what kind, what kind of material you're looking at, sir? And then how would you think, how would you classify what kind of a cyst you're looking at? Um, well, I would largely agree with you, Satyabama, on the uh, similarity between an autonogenic keratocyst okay, and so? an, uh, uh, amyloblastoma. But, uh, you know, there are certain things that I think uh, with clinical acumen, you realize uh, with one look that it's more likely to be an OKC or an amyloblastoma. And one of them I would say is yes, the sir. buccolingual expansion. Yes, sir. You find that the buccolingual expansion in OKC is very, very little. It tends to expand anterior posteriorly, especially in the mandible, through yeah. the marrow, rather than actually produce uh, expansion yeah. of yeah. the buccal or lingual. And when it does, it's usually the lingual uh, side. That is it one is. thing. And uh, um, very often, you can get an aspirate with an OKC, but very often you don't get an aspirate. And if you're doing a biopsy, you open it up and you see cheesy material, it's almost pathognomic of an OKC. I mean, I would use it, I would, I would I, I could actually say that it's an OKC without even having a um, uh, biopsy done. Uh, the cystic amyloblastomas could also have a lining. I mean, it wouldn't be solid, but the lining of the 
OKC is typically very, very thin. And uh, now those are things that you can look for even before you have a histopathological diagnosis. But of course, histopathology would, is the confirming factor and uh, you know, palisading cells, uh, paracaratin uh, layer on top. Those are things that are very, very uh, tombstone appearance of the basal layers and things like, which are pathognomic of uh, amino, uh, OKCs, whereas aminoblastomas have their own um, unique features depending upon whether it's plexiform or uh, cystic. Uh, yes, sir. Cystic. There are different types of them. Yeah, very true. Right, sir. Now, a uh, question on your Staphne's bone cyst. Yeah. Would you treat them in the first place? And yeah. how do you manage them, sir? Yeah, that's a prospective question. Would I treat them, isn't it? Uh, I have actually seen one Staphne's bone cyst, perhaps. And I, I, don't, I, I don't think I treated it. And uh, at my age, I don't expect to see when you ask the question whether I would treat it. I don't expect to see what I've not seen 35 years. In my 35 years of practice, I don't expect to see one. But if I did see one, I think I would generally leave it alone. But you know, I have a personal uh, concern about these kind of cysts which have inclusions. It's Stephanie bone cysts is usually the salivary gland um, inclusion into the a bone which remains there as a cystic lesion. But you can also have fat, you can also have lymph node. I mean, I've heard, read reports uh, about those. Um, uh, I have a small concern about these kind of uh, ectopic material uh, in the bone. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, ectopic tissues anywhere. I mean, if you look at an undescended testis, for example, uh, a number of ectopic tissues, they have a very large propensity to turn yeah, into neoplastic lesions. So I don't know, it might be a good idea to actually remove them. Um, and also for, for the, because the patient is concerned that there is a cyst. Uh, but a large body of evidence shows that if we leave them alone, uh, there, there wouldn't be a problem. So I think it's an individual choice uh, as to whether uh, what I would do with it. Well, I have to see more cases to really tell you that. Uh, it's a rare, in, 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 in short, it's rare. It's extremely rare. The question that's coming up, sir, is should we always go for a CT to go about with an OKC and amyloblastoma? Uh, and why, how do you justify that? Isn't an OPG sufficient for it? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one, really, you know. Uh, well, uh, well, I started doing um, OKCs at a time when, uh, generally, you know, at a time when uh, CT scans were not uh, readily available. So. We did manage, in fact, OPGs were not available. Sometimes it's just x-rays. But um, uh, I think uh, considering that it, the cost is not very significant, the CT scan is uh, ubiquitous today, uh, particularly after the COVID uh, thing where everybody's having a CT chest done, it wouldn't really cost so much or really, I mean, this, uh, today's machines uh, have less amount of radiation exposure. So I think it would be a good idea to have a CT scan to really know the extent because Sometimes the OPG may not give you a three-dimensional uh, idea about... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Most of the time when you are thinking, you know, the, it is involving the nerve, it, the lesion is more buckly placed than, yeah. in, you know, um, amidst Absolutely. the nerve. Absolutely. Yes, yes sir. OKC particularly tends to be lingually placed in the ramus. So uh, you might actually have to go uh, hunting a little before you find the cyst if you don't have an OPG. I'm sorry, a CT. Yeah. Uh, usage of drains and OMFS, sir, and where to use them? What kind of drains are available? Uh, I don't know. This is about cysts, and I don't use drains in cysts uh, uh, these days. You know, I, I tend to not use them. But uh, I think if you want to do a decompression, you can actually use one of the uh, drains, uh, the hollow drains as a decompression technique. I know that some people use it, particularly if they want to defer a definitive surgery for a longer period of time. I use my drains mostly for dead spaces in soft tissues, like in the neck, for example. I mean, I definitely would use a, uh, um, a drain, okay. Uh, like, for a vacuum drain. Uh, a suction yeah. drain. Yeah. But uh, uh, there, were, there was a time when I used to use uh, just red rubber drains because of the cost factor. We were operating in uh, charity on for charitable reasons and sometimes to you know, cut down costs, we did that. But a suction drain is very useful for soft tissue dead spaces. I'm not too sure about the cysts. I've used it uh, in OKCs a few times, but uh, what I've seen is uh, I, I prefer to leave it open these days and to give an obturator and allow the decompression 
to you know bone mitigates against pressure so you decompress and bone begins to form and fill up the space at some uh, probably on of some of our uh, um, uh, it's it's, inter groups. it's interesting yeah. as you're saying about the train in OKC. I think there was an article by Brendan who and, and co who talked about decompression of the cyst using a drain so that you know the lining becomes a bit more thickened. Yes. And one, once that has been left in time for a period of time, and then they went in and removed, enucleated the lesion, the OKC. Their rec uh, amazingly, the recurrence rate was zero percent, sir. So I think, yeah. um, uh, that's that's a good thought process, you know, for okay. people to think yeah. of why not I do a decompression, allow it to drain, and then yeah. go in for an enucleation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think what they use is uh, more like a, a, a kind of a tube drain, which would uh, which can be fixed, like you like you've shown the uh, on the on the left, my left. Uh, the yeah. with, the with a safety pin uh, yeah. to prevent it from going inside. But now you have ready-made uh, 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 drains available, uh, which which do not get pulled into the cyst. You know they are shaped like an hourglass. Yeah. So you, you, you have them. Yeah, uh, it's a good idea. In fact, there is a, a, one of the uh, accepted forms of treatment for an OKC is to first decompress where not only the not only the lining and the soft tissue, but the bone begins to form. And then go in for an enucleation. And uh, I have also seen that uh, there's a large body of evidence to say that uh, they, the results are very good. But I don't use that technique. I actually do both of them together. I enucleate whenever possible, unless it's extremely thin. Okay. Or something like that. I enucleate and leave it open. I mean, uh, basically going to, on to Stollinger's theory that the 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 pathology lies under the oral mucous membrane. So uh, you know, we deroof it remove the mucous membrane and um, pack it initially and then give them an obturator and the obturator's patient self cleanses the obturator. So there is decompression and there is also enucleation. I do both of them together. And personally, it's anecdotal. I have extremely good um, results about with, uh, I've very, very rarely had uh, recurrences. Uh, on the other hand, I'm sure you can use a, a suction drain or some kind of drain to Okay. and then go for it, yeah. So there's an interesting question. Do you always use a grommet, um, you know, when you're doing a Mars no, supplication? No, no, no. I mean, no, Bob, the grommet is, uh, uh, grommet is actually very, very small. They use it in ENT. I think you're talking oh, draining. about- draining, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think you're talking about the grommet, which is much larger, which can be used for the- Yeah. Uh, assist, yeah. So, um, no, I don't, I don't use that, but I've uh, heard of people using it and, getting good results with it. What I do is now fairly standard as far as I'm concerned. I do de-roof the cyst, remove the cyst lining, uh, pack it, uh, remove the uh, enucleate it, then cure it with the burr and use a chemical curettage with the carnoid solution and then uh, leave it open for it to heal. And usually three to six months, the bone forms completely, depending on age. In young yes, people, yes. much earlier. Really. Yes, sir. There's another question on how to preserve the inferior alveolar nerve while using carnoy solution. Yeah, I, I've seen that article by Stollinger who says that uh, if you left, uh, if you used it for two or three minutes, uh, the nerve really wouldn't be damaged. Uh, what I do, uh, uh, in fact, I, I put it up on one of those groups that we have. Um, I, if, if it's possible, I try to pick up the inferior alveolar nerve and protect it with. Uh, Bit of gauze. It's not very easy to do that. But gauze, gauze, and Vaseline, and then use the carnoid solution indiscriminately within the cyst. Uh, that is one way of protecting it. I've had reasonably good results with that. The other thing that you can do is to, uh, well, move the uh, inferior alveolar nerve around and uh, uh, as try to avoid uh, application on the nerve because there is no perineural spread in an OKC. And um, these days, uh, I think uh, I have no experience with it, but uh, um, FFU, uh, which is an anti-metabolite uh, chemotherapeutic agent, is being widely used instead of a carnoid solution because of the fears of possible malignancies with uh, uh, chloroform in the carnoid solution. I still use carnoid solution. Um, so that okay. is going to significantly reduce uh, neurosensory deficit by injury to the the neurovascular bundle. Yeah. So, so that's I think it's just a matter of being careful. Solution, so, yeah. you, can, you can use carnoid solution as, as, as uh, 
not only Sterling, a couple of other um, reports also say that using it for about two or three minutes will not, but they also say that you need to use it for about five minutes. Um, yeah, but so, five minutes, you know, the, there was a study which said five minutes if it has been used and the depth of penetration is into the nerve tissue is about, uh, you know, around 0.8 or 1.4 something. And so, you know, yeah. it affects the, it causes the um, degeneration of the nerve. So they really don't advise to use more than yeah. uh, three to five minutes, uh, not yeah. more than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely not more than five minutes. I use it for two, two minutes or three minutes. I also do a thorough thing. But I think it's none of these things. You know, I think there are numerous studies which have shown that if you leave it open and decompressed, or, or you use decompression, the lining of the, the, the OKC lining of the cyst, even if you don't actually curate it, actually goes, undergoes squamous metaplasia and becomes like the oral mucous membrane. Uh, quite a few studies. I think one of the discussions we have had with the uh, South End uh, uh, group uh, a few months ago, uh -huh. uh, the, the pathologist was saying that they have evidence to show that there is transformation of the cyst lining into uh, oral mucous membrane lining. So okay. uh, uh, decompression, okay. I think, is a very important part of uh, treatment of OKCs today. So this is the efficacy of topical 5-fluorouracil in treating OKC. Yeah, it's contraindications and complications. Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I see the picture and I see the uh, details there, but... Uh, yeah, it causes uh, DNA damage and uh, DNA and RNA damage. I, I know that it causes DNA damage and RNA damage like most chemotherapeutic agents, but the details just go over my head, really. And I, this is new to me that uh, patients with dipyridamine dehydrogenase activity. Quite a uh, few articles on that, sir, which talk about yeah, the yeah. risk of these patients who are, you know, are deficient on yeah. this. And it is interesting, you know, and it increases the INR on patients yeah, who are uh, on yeah, warfarin. But, but INR increase happens with a lot of drugs. And, you know, virtually yeah. every drug uh, interacts with warfarin, really. So and, uh, uh, INR uh, is increased. Um, so uh, myelosuppression, of course, any chemotherapeutic agent would cause myelosuppression, but I don't know if just application would actually result in that. Hypersensitivity, cross, yeah, too many drugs. Uh, this is the first point that I really do not know about. I'm learning about it now, yeah. You learn a lot of things when you're old. <laughs> Sir, Gollin syndrome. Now, okay. how would you, would you recommend uh, every person with multiple OKCs to have okay. Gollin syndrome tested for? Is that? Is uh, it I think, you know, Yes, uh, I've, I've actually, I think I have a couple of um, uh, international publications as well on, or national publications, I don't remember, on Gollin syndrome. I've seen quite a few cases and treated them. Um, I don't treat them differently from how we treat uh, uh, sporadic uh, OKC. Um, we would do the same thing. Uh, as I said, open, enucleate, uh, cure it, use carnoid solution, and then uh, allow uh, use obturators and keep them decompressed. That's what I do. But I think the more important thing that you need to understand is that the chances for recurrence with uh, Gollin syndrome is much, much more than it is with uh, mm -hmm. isolated or sporadic lesions. And then um, I've actually never seen a patient with uh, basal cell carcinoma. I think it's not very common in our population, but I've seen a lot of people with uh, NAVI they, they have a lot of nevi and uh, quite a few cases with uh, bifid rib syndrome. I don't remember whether I ever, ever investigated anybody for spina bifida. Uh, frontal bossing, hypothalorism, yes, uh, very typical. Okay. Thing. So I think what you need to really be concerned about treating gollin gott syndrome is that uh, in addition to treating the cyst, you need to have some kind of a surveillance for the other issues like BCC and things like that. And... Uh, mm, Always expect <laughs> recurrence or de novo lesions. In fact, I have, I, have, I, have, I have a few slides on de novo lesions in patients with uh, Gorlin syndrome. So okay. you can have new lesions coming up as well. So you need to keep them on surveillance for a very, very long time, 20 years, 25 years, whatever. Okay. There's a very uh, small question on what is, um, you know, modified carnoids. Nothing but it's just that the chloroform is excluded. And uh, from the basic composition, because basic composition is absolute alcohol, glacial acetic acid, chloroform, and fericlorite, 6113 ratio. But then here, in a modified carnoise, you do not have the uh, chloroform that's excluded. Yeah. Just a small question there, sir. So. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, uh, no, uh, 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 since you're on the topic, I'd just like to mention that they yes, also sir. use this. They also use this gel, which can be uh, cryo frozen, and it actually destroys the cell wall. You know, okay. this gel that you apply into the uh, cyst, and then you use a cryo probe onto the gel, and that freezes the gel and destroys the uh, lining, and that is supposed to be sparing to the neurovascular bundle as well, in addition to FFU. Okay. Wonderful. I just remembered it. Yeah, just, I yeah. It. yeah. Wonderful. So, a negative wound pressure, your um, experience on that, would you, you know, it's most often used in... Uh, that, 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 was, that was the same question on uh, um, suction drains, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, well, sir, any, anybody, um, you know, th these pumps are available, you know, these kind of pumps are available. Wherein you know you apply negative pressure, yeah, okay, you yes. take away the atmospheric pressure, and you leave this so that it it causes uh, neo generation of blood angioneo generations, and then it helps in healing burns and diabetic ulcers, especially. Now, um, I'm sure I, I, I have no experience with it, but I can try to answer something if. If I know yeah. about it, yeah. Yes, sir. So wounds that are not, you know, closer to vessels, contraindicated, and joints, you know, open up, yeah. you know, because of their movements, so not to use. Mm -hmm. And patients on anticoagulants and antiplatelets are to be devoid of using that, sir. Now, the treatment protocol for an amyloblastoma in children, how would you, what would you go, how would you go about? What would be your yeah. pro protocol, sir? Uh, now, uh, Satyabama, if you're asking me, see, uh, this is what I ask your mentor. So it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, there are several people going in for examinations and uh, uh, you might uh, end up meeting an examiner who thinks that all amyloblastoma should be resected. And if you said conservative treatment, they might actually fail you. So you need to be very careful if you're using any of the uh, uh, if, if you're trying to answer this question, you need to have your citations ready for each of the situations. And if your examiner is good enough to accept your citations, it's good. So I think you can treat it conservatively, you can treat it aggressively. And in children, I think uh, since, I mean, over the years, uh, it's, it's an extremely painful option of having to remove the jaw of a young child. I would give it the one chance of... Uh, enucleation or conservative treatment, almost treated like an OKC, really. You know? And I've had some extremely good results for children because they have good, got good osteogenic potential, but you need to keep them in surveillance. And if they do recur, or you may have to do multiple surgeries sometimes, and if they do, if they do recur, then uh, as a last resort, really do a resection because you know, uh, from the point of view of the deformity that it causes, it's an extremely painful decision for a benign but aggressive lesion. Yeah, uh, yeah. If, sir, if I am I am the parent, then in my if my child has a problem, then I would I would not go for a section. I would go for a conservative treatment. I mean, I think it depends on uh, on the scenario, on the individual patients, at the and the unit that we are working with makes a decision on that. It's a very controversial subject, but most people now, even in adults, they are using this. They are uh, not, uh, uh, you know, trying to do a conservative treatment on these so that. Um, patient is spared of the disfigurement and, you know, yes, hence sir. both the psychological uh, aspects to it. Yes, sir. Yeah, now, the, how about the transformation of these uh, OKCs and dentigerous cysts to amyloblastoma? Have you come across in your... I, I have, I have. Actually, I have a very close friend of mine uh, who, uh, had, who probably had a dentigerous cyst because when I saw him, uh, he had advanced... Uh, malignancy in his jaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a visible cyst. You know, you could see the cyst in parts. So I'm sure it was one of those cases where it had transformed. Uh, unfortunately, it passed away within eight months. It was very aggressive and okay. it uh, metastasized and things like that. But uh, having said that, I think the percentage transformation, of course, is much more than in normal jaws. But I think it's slightly more higher risk for OKCs as well yeah, as for the Yes, yes, very true, sir. And I yeah. think I've read this uh, paper that orthokeratinized uh, um, OKCs, which are not actually uh, classified as OKCs anymore. They're just called orthokeratinized cysts. Now, they have a tendency to transform more into 
uh, malignancies for some reason. They have a high transformation rate, but their rate of recurrence is very low. It's very low, that's right. Yeah, that's right. compared to the paracatinized okay. ones. So the is, ortho, yeah. I think that 2017 uh, classification yes, took uh, orthokeratinized uh, uh, cysts outside of OKCs. It's not yeah. called an OKC anymore. And yeah. uh, just for the information of the people who are listening, for several years, I think from 2004 or something like that, till 2017, it was called a KCOT. That is a characteristic yeah. ontogenic and, tumor. Yes. And I still feel that it should be treated like a benign tumor, benign aggressive tumor, like an amyloblastoma. Not, not in terms of resection, but yeah. by its behavior, it definitely behaves more like a tumor than a cyst, yes. That is mainly because I wouldn't, I would agree to disagree with you, sir, because it is, it is the lining, it is the mucosa overlying the lining that opens into the mouth and an adjuvant, uh, chemical cauterization. If it is done, then I think we could avoid its recurrence. Um, no, 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 no Sadiwa, I'm not talking about the recurrence. I mean, a recurrence, uh, yes, it has a high tendency for recurrence. I'm just talking about purely the classification. So if you, if you look at the reasons they gave for classifying it back into a cyst, is uh, something to do with its uh, uh, clono clonosity. I think there's a word called clonosity, uh, which means that the parent uh, uh, cell population yes. should yeah. be represented yeah. and things yeah. like that. So it's, it's, it's a, the reasons for why it is classified as a cis-standard tumor is different. It doesn't change the treatment at all. I agree with your treatment. I would, I would still go for uh, conservative treatment, enucleation, curatage, thermal solution, and keeping it open. That's my line of treatment, but I would still go with the treatment, yes. Uh, uh, but, Let's not uh, take the controversies here, so fine, sir. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Then the question now is, how would you follow an OKC patient? Now, I was uh, looking for articles and there are no protocols per se designed. However, um, um, it was Tolinga who has mentioned in his articles about you know, the follow-up pattern. I think the latest article was in 2018. He's picked up, no, 2016. He's picked up about eight, 82 or some you know, odd numbers of these patients and he's reviewed them uh, initially, he did them uh, biannually uh, for a year and then every year for five years and following which every once in two years for 25 years, he's reviewed them. And then uh, I think, I do not know if I got this article. Yeah, 82 patients. Yeah, that's right. And um, this article, sir. And then he says, you know, these patients that, that were reported, um, only nine of them had a recurrence and that too within the first five years. So you know, um, that is the follow-up period that he's, uh, he's devised in his review up for 25 years. What would you suggest? Yeah, I, I would, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, Stollinger uh, because I believe uh, uh, the tumor actually arises, tumor or cyst really, actually arises from the sub-epithelial uh, tissues, uh, remnants of the uh, ontogenic tissues, of course, but and that is the reason why Stollinger always um, recommends that the mucosa covering it should be removed. You know, mm. it should be removed. It's excised. Yeah. And um, of course, I, I differ slightly in my in my treatment plan with from what Stollinger. But essentially, the principle is the same: that you decompress and uh, enucleate and decompress, and it always heals up. Um, uh, as I told you, my my treatment is slightly different, but it's it's more or less in line with what he is. Uh, Suggesting. I so don't keep is, packing it. Yeah. What is your take on the sclerosing agents, sir? Their usage, contraindications in vascular malformations. Is vascular malformations part of this? Uh, this I, don't, I don't know. If it's, if you want to? I can. I can always uh, talk about it. I uh, I have um, mostly used surgery for uh, vascular malformations and for hemangioma. So in terms of the uh, persistent uh, non-involuting. Hemangiomas. I've always used uh, surgery. surgery uh, yeah, yes. uh, the only time, very early in my practice, when I was scared to do a vascular lesion, I would inject uh, boiling water. So I have very little experience with the commercially available sclerosing agents like sodium tetradacyl, uh, tetradacyl sulfate, and things like that. I mean, I know of it the theoretically, and I keep forgetting the name all the time because I don't use it. Yeah, so the so most commonly used one is the sodium tetradacyl sulfate. Yeah. 
there are quite a few of them that are being in market you know there are new ones which have come up as well there is and something you, the progesterone and estrogen combination yeah, like there is a hormonal yeah i know i know about that there is a hormonal yeah. preparation there is also bleomycin i don't see that here yeah i i there were yeah. a lot of contraindications so i take took, took yeah. it off the list and um, okay. there's something called polyadocanol and then you I'm, have this serotonin and no. norepinephrine modulating agent i have the, no experience with any of these things except so this I've is the new the very sodium. new one the veloxacin okay. is a very new one but then you know the the reviews are pretty good about it mm -hmm. so i thought you know the post graduates should uh, yeah. be able to name a Definitely. few when they're asked about the sclerosing agents so absolutely that's the reason that you, you, i thought you can, you can start with uh, boiling water actually you know boiling hot uh, absolutely I, I took boiling water in my early years of practice so seriously that i actually uh we used to have these glass syringes so you know i used to keep the water in the glass syringe and keep a uh, uh bunsen burner not a bunsen burner spirit lamp below it and actually see it boiling and then inject it into the lesion it produces an enormous amount of inflammation fibrosis and it de definitely has a good effect i'm sure sclerosing agents are good but i've not used the chemical ones unfortunately these days i operate on them i you know. so there is one interesting question here in case of an aggressive cyst and where wherein the you know the extent of uh, the cyst is gone up to the lower border and um, so in such a case how are you going to manage um manage your treatment trying to maintain the continuity and uh, the continuity of the inferior border how would you go about with that yeah i, I mean a, a ct scan would actually give you i mean an opg what looks like only a small rim of uh, lower border maybe may have actually lingual uh, bone which is buttressing on lingual side and things like that. so that's why a ct would be really useful in those situations but in all these uh, cyst situations at least for legal reasons you should always tell them of the possibility of a pathological fracture and uh, fixation if required but i would still go with uh, enucleation yes sir in the regular way yeah. but you i would know, be I ready think, for i think the I'd question for, here is you know they're asking about would you be supporting it with a reconstruction plate or would you I mean, technically, you would uh, do an intermaxillary fixation, produce uh, producing, and giving an immobilization for the patient, and yeah. then open up intraorally, open up the lesion, fix the mm -hmm. uh, plate in position, and then uh, go about doing the enucleation if necessary. Do the enucleation and then refix yeah. these plates that have been already, you know, drilled and pinned. Yeah, so, I, I've never, I've never seen a, a protocol like that. No, but really, but uh, fixing a plate really and then doing works. it. It really yeah. works, sir. And it's pretty uh, good. I, I've, I've never done that. I've had a couple of fractures, but I've never done that. Okay. And, uh, the, it's always healed very well. Okay. Know. So the difference between peripheral ostectomy and marginal or segmental resection. Now, uh, is there yeah. a problem with the question there? Because a peripheral ostectomy and a marginal uh, resection are the same thing. And the segmental yeah. resection is different. Segmental resection is a continuity resection, which means that the whole segment is removed. Yeah, yes, well, yeah, well, yeah well, you see that there. Yeah, right. The top two ones are marginal or um, peripheral ostectomies, and, and the these lower ones are, are segmental, segmental yeah. resections. Yeah. Yes, the one I mean, segmental. I mean, yeah, I mean, just add that you know, if you're doing a segmental resection in the anterior region, I think you should give it enough opportunity to try to save the lower border because reconstruction of the anterior part of the mandible is very difficult, very unsatisfactory, even in the best of hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, I would, yeah. I know, with with three D printing and all those kind of things, I am sure that they they've come kind of uh, got over that. I have no experience with it, but I know that anterior reconstructions are difficulties. Yes, sir. And then the recurrence rate in OKC is very commonly asked viva question. I think they oh. wanted to keep a viva for a yeah. Yeah. So, I, I think I think uh, is there another slide which tells you? Yeah, I'll go back to the old one. This is. Yeah, uh, thirty-two to sixty-eight percent would be if you just did uh, uh, a normal nucleation, a nucleation and then closed yes, it. Yes, uh, That would be the thing. But if you did a decompression, or uh, nucleation, curettage, and you know, did all of them, the whole works uh, in different um, uh, protocols, of course. Uh, I'm sure the results are much better. And as you yes, can sir. see, the, the, so the, is, yeah, I think uh, yeah. just something to be mentioned here. Uh, we must remember that cysts usually, the, the inflammatory cysts, uh, uh, starts off with a proliferation of the rest cells. And then uh, they exert a pressure on the wall and it keeps growing inside the bone. And then uh, there's lack of blood supply to the innermost part of the uh, 
group of cells and the proliferated cells. Hydrostatic which, expansion. Yeah, yeah, which was liquid and hydrostatic expansion. So, Neural but, expansion and the theories yeah, of expansion. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that, that is the classic way that a cyst expands. That's why you have buccolingual expansion. But uh, in OKCs, it does have some amount of pressure uh, uh, which causes expansion, but it's mostly because of actual breakdown of bone, collagen, and things like that. And that happens because of the presence of, you know, as you mentioned here, the ACI2, yes, interleukin, cytokeratin, and of course, prostaglandins play a very important role in. And yes, sir, this is quite uh -huh. an interesting article which talks about this BCL2 and interleukins. And yeah. henceforth, you know, it causes, it stops the apoptosis of the surface epithelium. So in okay. other words, the surface epithelium keeps keeps uh, surviving and then it mm -hmm. keeps mitotic because of these um, yeah. uh, increased mitosis. And along with the matrix MMPs, the matrix metalloproteins, yeah. it causes a high recurrence rate. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, and now, uh, uh, since you talked about recurrence and other reasons, uh, is there another slide on recurrence? Because it, uh, another reason for recurrence, I think you know, there are some factors which are very important. If you remove the cyst in toto, the recurrence is very low. If the bone is fenestrated, the recurrence is high. Uh, you know, there are some things. If the lining is very thin, the chances of leaving behind some cyst lining is very high, if you're, particularly if you're closing it primarily. So there are some factors which make recurrence much more possible than normal, also in syndromic cases. Yeah. Yeah. So this is for the benefit of the question of um, uh, multilocular lesions. There were question based on um, angle of mandible or posterior mandible, and then uh, unilocular uh, radiolucent lesions, and then multilocular lesions. So this is a common unilateral ones, uncommon unilateral ones. So uh, we just have left them for the reference of the post. Yeah, yeah. They, they can, of course. Yeah. They're not going to read through it, yeah. <laughs> And based on the origin, either they're odontogenic or non-odontogenic. Yeah. So yeah. either amyloblastoma or odontogenic yeah. myxoma. Oh, and odontogenic myxoma is not so rare, actually. I've, I've seen quite a few of them. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, pinbox tumor, I've seen one. And amyloblastic fibroma is also something that the pathologists report from time to time. It doesn't change okay. my treatment plan anyway. Okay. So that's the difference between the question is, Differentiation between an amyloblastoma and an adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. Uh, would I be right, uh, Satyabama? If I'm, I'm not recently read an, I'm, I've not read a recent article on the AOT, but it's not considered as a but yeah, yeah. tumor anymore. Yeah, is it right? The con uh, yes, the, we, yeah. leave the, we leave the controversies <laughs> away, sir, yeah. for the sake so, of the postgrads. So, so the, yeah. The, so uh, anyway, it's got a very low recurrence rate. Uh, I've never tried from the genetic tumor. So that's um, the AOT, which was there, which was completely. I yeah. must thank um, uh, Dr. Vivek and team for uh, sharing this uh, picture okay. with us. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I've actually seen very few cases in the maxilla, although I know that okay. uh, there's a predilection for the maxilla, but the mandible like this is much more. But this this, this is not an um, okay. This is not an AOT, obviously. Yeah. This is so, yeah. I'm not asking of the yeah, anterior yeah. mandible stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. And this is a tough decision to make, you know, because yeah. reconstruction is a challenge, really. Real challenge. Multilocular radiolucent lesions are um, about, we did yeah. okay, see a bit, we already on and dealt on. with all these, isn't it? Yeah, giant cells are so going on to giant cells. And before that, the question on soap purple and honeycomb lesions are they different or are they the same? Uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, tell you something. I'm just briefly, you know, I, uh, I remember I remember in my third year of pathology, uh, one a boy who'd come from a village in Kerala. I was I studied in Trivandrum, the government dental college, there. and uh, I remember uh, the description of strawberry tongue, one of those things, you know, and uh, he he didn't know what a he's never he's never seen a strawberry in his life, so you know a lot of these uh, soap bubble honeycomb and things like that, uh, it's. It's been created by people who are familiar with these things in daily Absolutely. life. Absolutely. So a honeycomb lesion to a person who's not seen a honeycomb is going to be pretty difficult to tennis racket. I suppose most people see tennis rackets are at least a mosquito uh, rackets, you know, that you get wrong these days. Yeah, it's, it's just a way of explaining them, I suppose. Yeah, I think we have a picture here that shows us a bit. Yeah, that's where it goes. So, so that's unicystic. Uh, type yeah, yeah, and of that's course. a spider web type and that's okay. a, a honeycomb 
and okay. a multilocular or a soap bubble appearance. Well, what about the tennis racket? I didn't see one then. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. you know about the tennis racket mm. anyway. So multiocular radiolucency is you know away from the alveolar bridge and then towards the tooth bearing area and uh, involving nerves and the lymph nodes. And we have depending on the expansile pattern. Yeah. This, 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 is a, this is a nice uh, algorithm actually. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't know about the tennis racket pattern, but you know, uh, looking at the radiograph and actually trying to make a clinical diagnosis. Uh, yeah. It's for good for the postgrads to have a format in yeah, their yeah. Uh, algorithms uh, so that yeah. they can really easily go through things. There's a nice article actually. Right. Um, so if it is a root resorption causing, then it's a uh, glandular odontogenic. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, not a glandular odontogenic. And if it causes root resorption, yes, it's a solid ameloblastoma. Mm. And then the multilocular ones, discrete lesions and diffuse lesions. Now, this is interesting, this uh, giant cell lesions. I know, we okay. finish off this uh, honeycomb pattern and soap bubble pattern with this. Okay. Um, so, aneurysmal bone cysts and amyloblastoma come into the honeycomb pattern, whereas your soap bubble is with all your multilocular uh, cysts, amyloblastoma again, and OKC. Um, yeah, it's for the benefit of the postgrads to have a look at these kind of uh, differential diagnosis. Yeah. The scalloped is very, very typical of the OKC, you know, scalloped. Okay. Okay. If we know what a scallop is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, how do you differentiate a giant cell lesion from hyperparathyroid lesion? So that's the question. Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the hyperparathyroid lesion also has giant cells. So it's true, giant very cell true. Lesion. Now, how do you, she want, they want to know, uh, how do you differentiate uh, clinically or looking at the patient or at the lesion? Yeah. Uh, what kind of investigations would you do? The question should have yeah. been uh, Serum calcium. I'm sure you need to do serum calcium. I'm not sure about alkaline phosphatase. I think that's raised as well. Uh, Multinucleated uh, giant cells with osteoclasts. Yeah. And the only uh, thing yeah. is, um, so this is um, giant cell. The primary has hypercalcemia, whereas the secondary has hypocalcemia. So, which means that the calcium level is really not important, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so that's an example of a brown tumor that we're looking yeah. at. So that's how it is being presented. Yeah. So I, I've done I've done a couple of uh, uh, I mean I've, I've operated on a few um, brown tumor, and I think I remember my uh, long case for my DNB exam was also a brown tumor. So but this, you know, having said that. I was just wondering whether uh, uh, I remember once operating on them and the, uh, I had a general surgeon come in and remove a uh, hyperparathyroid uh, tumor as well. He removed the, he did a hyperparathyroidectomy as well. And then he said, uh, I did operate on the lesion. I, it, it's, it's a very vascular lesion, you know, the uh, hyperthyroid, the bronze tumor is a very okay. vascular lesion. Yeah. And he said that it actually wouldn't be necessary to do that. You just remove the uh, reason for the hyperparathyroidism and uh, the cyst will go away. That's what he said. Yeah, once uh, that is corrected, once the hyperparathyroidism is corrected, I think everything settles down. Sorry. It settles down. So you don't really have to operate on them. Uh, but uh, but uh, then, yeah, but then if there is a huge uh, expansion... Uh, apparently, yeah. apparently, it just disappears it's over a period of time, okay. six months or something. Okay. But so I did the, operate. the next question is on the um, how to manage a lesion, you know, with a feeder vessel or a vessel around it. So how to manage getting, a lesion with a vessel around? Uh, that uh, sorry, just go back on that. Uh, just uh, that, that's uh, with that's a vessel uh, around. Uh, a bit of an ambiguous question because uh, if you're talking about like the neurovascular bundle in a OKC, uh, well, we already talked about it. It could be but, anything. Yeah, the question is yeah. quite open, sir. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, uh, how to manage a lesion with a vessel? I suppose, uh, I don't know what it means, really. Yeah. So, <laughs> vascular anomalies, yes, I can tell you something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Kind of, more or less. So, this particular and, patient uh, came with, with mobile teeth and episodes of bleeding. Now, yeah. yes, sir. Can That's you my patient, right, this? isn't it? Yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember this patient. It's, I still see him, and I think it's a miracle he's alive. Because somebody was planning to do actually do an uh, uh, either an extraction or a biopsy. If 
for this patient. Okay. Fortunately for the patient, he had a bleeding episode and he was admitted to the hospital. I was called in and I, I was immediately flagged, uh, flagged it off when I saw those capillaries on the lingual side, you know, and also the fact that the tooth was, you know, it's compressible tooth, the teeth which were there. And, and uh, we operated on the patient immediately. I think we have a couple of pictures on that. Yeah, you can see the uh, CT angio as well as the lesion. Uh, this was a tough one because we didn't tell the patient we had to do a, we, we, we would probably need a mandibulectomy and intraoperatively we took a decision to do a mandibulectomy. Yeah, can I see the, the next one? This is about uh, your uh, yeah, that, ligation. So, yeah, we took control of that. Removed, did a mandibulectomy, cleaned out the whole lesion uh, with the best way I knew because it was not anticipated. Put it back again and the uh, patient was okay. <laughs> it's taken up. Wonderful, sir. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, this is why, yeah, young children. Yeah. yeah, so what are the investigations that you would recommend on a lesion, a bony lesion like that, sir, before even you uh, think of your treatment plan? So I, 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 don't, I don't, yeah, I, I, uh, ultrasound is fine, but I don't think it will pick up a bony lesion uh, as well. But I think definitely uh, a CT angio would be very useful. I don't, I don't see it here, yeah, it's there. A CT angio would be very useful. MRI, yes, uh, all of them, really. Um, you, you can never be more, you know, more careful with the vascular yeah. lesion, especially if it's inside the bone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And digital and substration. Treatment, treatment options, sir? How would you go about with your treatment options? Uh, mine is only surgical. I don't do any of these things. So, But I, I'm sure those PGs would need to know them, those operations. And when you go for a surgical option, uh, intralational uh, mm, injections and all these other things are only at, can I go to the other slide? You should have slide before this. No, one before. Yeah, uh, the one after this. See, embolization doesn't mean that you can avoid surgery. You need to do embolization and do surgery. Intralational sclerosing agents is only to help you in your surgery. Surgical excision, of course, is there and reconstruction depending upon your, what's available to you, yes. Uh, these are all uh, Sanjeev Nair's uh, list. I think I just sent these pictures. Uh, they are not technically cysts or tumors. Uh, they are hematomas or you know, vascular malformations caused due to other lesions. I mean, the pictures explain themselves. You want to say something, Sadiq uh, Michael? I'm tongue tied looking at the extent of the lesion and the way yeah, it's been done. Yeah, so it's yeah. amazing. Uh, Sanjeev has actually come out with a classification that's accepted amongst the several classifications on. Um, uh, yeah, on these uh, yeah. presentation, where at the site of their uh, present uh, presentation. There, there is a society for uh, actually classifying vascular lesions. So, in addition to that, Sanjeev has added this to the okay. existing but, but yeah, He's got five classifications. So, number yeah. three is Grandelar. Grandelar yeah. yeah. And uh, the next one is the visceral one. So, which will be. Yeah. 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 So, at the end of the day, it's just your ability to operate, you know. <laughs> and to have control on the uh, vascular supply. And sometimes you can't do it in one surgery. Yeah. Nice algorithm, yes. <laughs> it's a beautiful algorithm, actually. Mangiomas, if it's proliferating. Yeah. I think this is, uh, this is something that PGs can actually keep in mind because you need to differentiate between hemangiomas and vascular malformations and high flow and low flow and uh, the involuting, non-involuting types. That gives you the whole picture. This is a very good slide which you can actually use if it's available. Um, that's wonderful, sir. We're just looking for some more questions that can come through. A few questions uh, that are here, we've already answered them. So, um, yeah, that's wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you so much. And Not great my presentation, actually. Uh, I'll just take this opportunity to thank Satibama. I'm, I'm on holiday in Aircourt and uh, it was difficult. I was even worried whether I would be able to get a connection here. Uh, she did everything. She prepared the slides and I sent her a few pictures. That's it. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Satibama. And thank you, Jimson. You're doing a wonderful job. You know, I think. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, yes. sir. It's a great pleasure to have uh, and, you with uh, us. Melita and Karthik, uh, I think they're the other two people who got in touch with me with regard to this. Thank you very much for this great opportunity and uh, um, I'm sorry for keeping Thank you. you sir. Thank Thank you so evening. much for your wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you. Yeah, Karthik, yes, I <laughs> Dr. Karthik, thank you so much. And yes, Melita, thanks a lot. 
on behalf of the of the team i would like to thank the organizers and the aomsi for giving us this opportunity to uh, be able to interact with the postgrads hope we've answered most of the questions for viewers for overshooting the time a bit but we really have tried our best to keep to the timings thank you so much everyone thank you rena ma'am thank you jimson dr jimson thank you everybody thank you thank you all yeah thank you rena i'm sorry for rena <laughs> uh Uh, Lena and Jimson, I think uh, both of you together have really done a great job uh, during this lockdown, keeping people informed. Uh, and I've learned a few things as well, much more than if we had conferences. I think. Right then. Uh, thank you all. On behalf of the organizing committee, we thank the mentors and the moderator for allotting your time and uh, explaining each and every query very patiently. the seventh session on malignancies and maxillofacial hard and soft tissue reconstruction which will be moderated by moderated by dr ramesh babu and mentored by dr madan mohan and uh, dr sandil murugan is scheduled to take place on 19th april which is coming monday at 8 pm uh, fill out the feedback form that will be posted in the chat box shortly if you participate in eight out of 11 session then you'll receive a certificate adios and have a good night good night good night thank you thank you dutch uh, pal sir and dr satya verma for the fantastic session and uh, bake sir as well it was uh, really a very good session thank you thank you thank you jimson sir thank you so much thank you bye 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 yeah. yeah. வேற யாத்தையும் போன்ல பேசுறீங்கன்னு நினைக்கிறேன் சாரி சார்